Give the Drummer Some is sponsored by Supernova Drum Company. Bespoke drums made with unique shell combinations using many different species of wood. Supernova Drum Company. Truly custom drums. Visit supernovadrums.com and facebook.com slash supernovadrumco for more details. Give the drummer some. Give the drummer some. Take back the crazy rhythm. It's nice to see you back in the old room again, Daddy. Give the drummer some. The 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 Fourteen mounted toms. Eight floor toms. Four splashes, two gongs, uh, ten cowbells, four rides, five snares, man. A roto tom rack. And it's all mounted on my infamous quadruple kick drum system. Hey! Please take my drum set! Hey! Knock it off! Well, another great performance that you put in was for the uh, the Dream Theater uh, drummer audition, and you know what? I'm sure you've been asked this a million billion times. So I apologize okay. in advance. No, that's all right. Um, I mean, honestly, guys don't. I mean, some some guys ask about it. Some some things, but um, you know, it's all good. I mean, it was cool. That was that again. It's another funny story behind that, and um, some of you have probably heard this story before. But um, it was interesting because I, you know. I'm very well of Dream Theater and very aware of Mike Portnoy and, and whatnot. But I'm because of my influences when I was a kid, being into the fusion and, and prog and jazz thing and, and coming from so many different styles of music, like I wasn't really, quote, a rock and roll or metal head. I really enjoyed the extreme stuff, and I wanted to see how far I can push it. And I loved hearing how far other people could push it. But overall, I wasn't really a big fan of metal. And I know that's sacrilege to say to a lot of the metalheads out there. I'm sorry. But, I mean, I did like the really, really extreme stuff um, for the time that I grew up with. Maiden, you know, on to Slayer, on to Napalm Death, on to the death metal, whatever. But when I was listening to Morbid Angel and stuff, there was no way I was going to be caught dead listening to Dream Theater. You know what I mean? I got you. I got you. <laughs> so I was never a Dream Theater fan. I was, like I said, very aware of the stuff and, and appreciated those guys and respected those guys as musicians. They're awesome, killer players. Yeah. Just not really my, my thing, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, my wife and I were going on vacation, and uh, I normally just avoid my phone altogether uh, when, I'm, when I'm out of town, especially when I'm going to see my folks and stuff up there in South Carolina. So. Right. My phone on like a Friday afternoon, we were driving up about 2.30 in the afternoon. I get a call from a good drummer buddy of mine and doesn't leave a message. And he calls back like five minutes later, doesn't leave a message. Then he calls back five minutes later, leaves a message. I'm like, all right. Then I get like started getting all these unknown number calls and voicemail boxes piling up. And like <laughs> drummers I haven't talked to in 10 years. And, you know, like what the hell is going on? Um so finally, I start getting my voicemail messages, and every one of them's like, oh, "Dude, did you hear Mike Portnoy quit Dream Theater? Dude, man, the world's gonna end. Uh, do you do you have numbers, man? Do you did anybody you know anybody at the management I can get in touch with? You know, and it was just one email after another. I mean, one phone call, voicemail after another of guys just wanting to ask me if I had anybody's phone number <laughs> you know, to get an audition with Dream Theater. Yeah. And my wife and I, man, we just thought it was the dang funniest thing because we kind of have this ongoing joke about the desperation sometimes of of people in the music industry and the links that people are willing to go to sometimes just to be that guy, you yeah, know. Yeah. And, um, you know, we laughed about it and we were like, oh, my God, this is funny. And I thought to myself, man, I've met Portnoy a handful of times. I don't know anybody else in the band, never ran in any of the same circles, no, none of these people or whatever. You know, this is why anybody think I could help them with the Dream Theater audition, you know, I don't know. Um, so fast forward about four days or so, we're on a vacation and still I'm getting phone calls and stuff. And Hallie looked at me one night after dinner and she says, look, what are you going to do when they call you? And I'm like, who? They've been calling me. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> and she was like, no, when, when, when they call you, what are you going to do? Because, you know, with the snakes and all this other stuff, because I just started building the snake business. And, I, you know, I do, I have 100 snakes here, you know, and uh, it's a lot to take care of and stuff. And, you know, and they've been doing really well for me um, financially. And just, you know, I've kind of taken like a left hand turn in my life here in the last seven years or so, you know, six years. And, and I was like, Hallie, you're crazy. They're not going to call me. Like I said, I don't even run in the same circle with these people, yada, yada, yada. So we're driving home, and I get an unknown number call me. 
which it wasn't odd because I kept getting other guys calling me from unknown numbers or whatever. Right. And I pick up the voicemail, and it's Frank, their manager, asking if I'd be interested in doing the audition. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was kind of weird. I My wife knew somehow or another um, that it was going to happen. And uh, I don't know. It was weird. I, I didn't know what to do. Um, I mean, I was flattered, and I was kind of blown away at the same time. Like, I, man, this is this is crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, wow, what am I going to do? And I told Hallie at the time, I said, I can't do this. You know, this is, it's not feasible for us right now. You know, it's just, I, they're going to want massive touring schedule. And it's just, not, I don't know. I don't know if it's doable, you know? Yeah. And she looked at me, she said, look, when dream theater calls you to go audition, you fucking go audition. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, all right. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. Um, uh, I had maybe two and a half weeks, I think. Right. I was out in the middle of doing some clinics, um, roundabout, and uh, I didn't really have a chance to play any of the songs on the drum kit until like two days before the audition here at home when I got home. <laughs> and um, it was cool playing with those guys because, um, you know, it's 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 a shame that they didn't press record when it came down to when our session started, which is kind of – it kind of made sense. I was right after Mangini, and we were so lackluster about – we just could Petrucci and I started talking and hanging out a little bit. Everybody was kind of – they just went through a four-and-a-half, five-hour audition with Mangini. Right. So people wanted to eat. Crew was hungry. So people were eating, doing their thing, taking a break, you know, outside smoking, doing their thing. So I set the drums up, to, you know, re, redid the kit, got my cymbals up, did our thing, just started talking to these guys. And we all just kind of just started playing at various random times, you know. Right. And then all of a sudden, we found ourselves playing the songs or whatever. And I think what happened was is people realized, oh, shit, they're doing the audition, and nobody pressed record. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's my honest assessment of what happened. <laughs> because I've used that excuse myself, corrupted audio, <laughs> when I've done the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's what happened in that regard. But it was it was a shame that it didn't get really fully recorded because, man, those three songs, I mean, we rocked them out, man. It felt like I've been playing with those guys for years. Right. Um, I mean, I nailed those songs. Um, that, that was fun playing with them. And then Jordan had this crazy, you know, odd metered thing that, um, you know, he threw at us, at all the drummers, you know, the same thing. And yeah. it just had this little tricky turnaround in it. And, you know, obviously for me um, – you know, I've I've gotten to the point, and I don't know if you know how much you know about my drumming history, but I've gotten this reputation as being this guy that records stuff in one take. Yeah, I, I see uh, that your nickname, one take. Yeah, and you know, with the extreme metal stuff, I mean, that was just because growing up in the studio environment, I was anti punch in and anti. You know, I I like to learn stuff and I like to play it and not have to piece it together. Right. Uh, and sometimes if that took me a little longer to actually learn what was going on, that I would sacrifice a day in the studio for something like that, you know? Right. And this is one of those instances where I was like, well, cool, yeah, I'll work on that or whatever. They're like, well, we want to see how fast you get it. And I was like, dude, I, why do you care? Are you looking to put yourselves in a situation where you're writing a record on the fly? Yeah. Because I'm not really interested in doing that, man. Because I, to be completely honest, every record that I've done, in my entire career, I've done on the fly, and I'm so sick of that. I don't have anything that represents me as a drummer outside of I'm on art from Hate Eternal because I put my foot down with that and told Eric, look, we're going to spend some time writing this record as a band. I want to at least hear the lyrics and know how the vocals go before I start you know, planning drum fills and cymbal parts and all this other stuff because it, everything that I've done, like my playing has always fought with everything else going on, and it was all because I never had time – to learn anything i mean king of all kings we wrote and recorded that record in two weekends the nile record i did in 17 hours <laughs> you know and like dude i'm so sick of doing that and i told those guys straight up like man i'm really not i don't know i mean just to spit something back out and i spit something back out at them but it wasn't anything that i would have creatively wanted to play you know right and we jammed out and we had a fun time and um I even threw something at them that kind of stumped those guys too, you know, and uh, so it was kind of a cool thing. And uh, you know, the, the the audition in and of itself was really killer. Um, the whole experience in itself was really killer, to be honest. I mean, it was a cool thing. I expected I wasn't going to get it. I knew going up there, I wasn't going to get it. Yeah, I knew going up there, I didn't want it. <laughs> and and I hate to say that, but it just wasn't feasible for me. Right. You know, with the animals and everything else, and I mean, dude, I've 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 easily got one hundred and seventy-five to two hundred thousand dollars wrapped up in animals. 
You know, so I mean, I for me at this point, I mean, yeah, if if Steve Morris called me and said, "Hey, I need you for three weeks," you know, to do to do a tour or whatever, and even recently, I had I just got offered the Fear Factory gig, and the same thing there. I told Dino, I was like, "Man, if if you only needed me for June and July, you know, if I was just filling in, I would love to do it, man. I would I would love to be able to do that. But for me to quit my life at this point in time for somebody else's band, yeah." You know, and a and a sixteen month touring schedule, um, I I just for me that's not feasible. Yeah. Um, now, if it's my own band, you know, and I go out for three four weeks at a time at my own leisure, that's one thing. But you know, to join another band and to and to get into that situation, I mean, look, I was flattered, and I and I told those guys straight up. I mean, right when I got there, I had a talk with the with the manager Frank. I told him what was going on and how much you know I was generating from the reptiles, and he was like, "Man, he goes, I don't blame you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I mean, for me to have to deal with rehoming all of these guys or you know hiring somebody full time to take care of them like that, you know, like I would, that would cost me a good deal of cash, man, and um, I just don't think that it would have weighed out in the long run, to be completely honest with you. Right, you know? I got you. So, but I was flattered. <laughs> too right. Well, were, were you happy with the footage that they put out in the in the documentary? <clears throat> um, look, man, I, you know, I don't really. When it comes down to it, I don't give a shit. You know, right. it is what it is. Like I said, I don't. You know, there were there were drummers that were upset. I'll just put it that way. You know, right. okay. and kind of talk shit and bad mouth the process or whatever. But I went into it knowing exactly what was going to happen. I knew exactly what because they, you know. Roadrunner had sent out this questionnaire and it was like 15 it was the same question asked 15 different ways and it was basically trying to get everybody to say they they would blow somebody to be the drummer for Dream Theater and I simply wasn't going to do that right and and if you notice they didn't include any of my interview footage <laughs> because I simply didn't give them the ammo to use right um, and if you and if you wonder why my part has hastily gone through um, and there's no interview footage or whatever. There's only that little bit of interview interview footage that they got of me after the interview. Right. Um, you know, because I wasn't going to sit there and be like, what would it mean to me to be the drummer for Dream Theater? Oh, gee, golly, guys, it'd be the best thing ever just to be chosen <laughs> to be, you know, I mean, and, and it's funny because I know that from talking to Marco and from talking from some of the other drummers that done that were doing this, I mean, they were doing it just to do it as well. I mean, a drummer like Marco, for him to stop musically doing everything that he does for Dream Theater, I just didn't see happening as well. But yet, it's edited to the point where it seems like it would be the biggest thing ever for him to be the drummer in that band. And I know for a fact that that wasn't the case. Right. I mean, he was already playing with Jordan and Petrucci in a project. What did it matter to him? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, but it's cut together like, oh, yeah, Dream Theater, to be the drummer for Dream Theater would be the best thing, you know, since sliced bread or whatever. And I know for a fact that, you know, that's not what was going through his mind. So right. the way it was edited was was done in a haphazard kind of way just to create a story and to make winners and losers. Yeah. But in the end of it, we were all winners. I mean, there any any one of us could have went in there and walked all over that gig. Yeah. You know? I, I must, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it because it was, you know, some of my favorite drummers, incredible drummers sort of performing and just, you know, another chance to see them again doing their thing. But... I must admit there was this certain X factor vibe behind it where there was this, you know, the way it was edited, where it would, you know, it, it would it, sort of like a story kind of teary eyed story. Oh, I really hope I get this gig. You know, that sort of thing that you'd see on those kind of audition type shows. Well, you know, I had, I had heard even that, that it was taking them so long because they were trying to, um, uh, they were trying to make some type of reality TV show out of it, and it was taking them longer than they expected with the footage. And then I heard that nobody was interested. Like they shopped it to MTV and <coughs> and VH1, and then nobody was really interested in putting it out. You know, right? Well, oh. but it it certainly did have that kind of reality TV show vibe. There was of course it did something there that was very much. You know, and it was funny because before I did the audition, Petrucci kind of said something to me under his breath, like, yeah, the record label's kind of making us do this because they don't think we'll sell units if there's not some drama attached. You know, I mean, that's not what he said, but that me reading between the lines, that's what it read to me, you know? Right, I got yeah, sure. 
Um, so, you know, and they, I mean, another thing he said too, is they knew immediately, I mean, I was right after Mangini. He told me straight up, Mangini's our guy. Right. You know, it's be hard to beat what, you know, hard to beat, you know, our feelings for, for, for him, you know, what, for him being in this band or whatever, you know. So they really just were doing it just to have footage, you know. Right. 